Hello, everyone. It is That Williams Guy, and we're recording at 308 Eastern, Sunday, April the 16th. And we have absolutely positively no plan for this show. It's just like, hey, who can record today? Because everybody's at the NRA annual meetings, and this is the Motley crew we were able to assemble on short notice. And uh, we'll get going from there. Uh, so we're probably going to do a round robin episode, but yeah, we'll see where it goes. Uh, up first, Steve Havey. Thanks, Lee. Well, oh, I'm doing an introduction. That's right. My name is Steve <laughs> Havey. I'm located in the uh, coming Georgia area, just north of Atlanta. I'm a range master certified instructor and in all the certifications they currently offer. I teach uh, small group classes, individual classes. I do the revolver and shotgun courses at a local gun range near me. And I run a defensive pistol match uh, three times a month. Hmm. Warren. Warren Wilson. Uh, been a cop since the 1900s, full time. I've been instructing for a lot less than that. Uh, I think I went to Tom's first instructor class in 2015, or my first range master class with Tom. Since then, I got my advanced and a perennial visitor to the uh, conference, of course, and take all the classes I can from everybody. I've got somewhere around 3,000 hours of training total law enforcement, about 1,100 that's cop stuff, range master for my department, and uh, OC instructor, and that kind of thing. Yes, and you have a Brahms right across the street from your PD. That's that's a little reason we're staying there. <laughs> they, they want, that's like, should we remodel or should we move? And they're like, eh, got a Brahms. That's right. So you have a Brahms on one side and a virtual simulator on the other, so it's like the perfect place to work. It's the perfect place. It's the happiest place on earth. Disney. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Dan. Uh, yeah, Dan Reedy, range master, master instructor, uh, OC instructor with Haggard, uh, former military. I teach a little bit private lessons, uh, right on the side as well. Where are you located now, Dan? Uh, now Las Vegas, formerly yeah. Kansas City. All right, I knew you had moved. I wasn't, wasn't certain where you had gone. Mm -hmm. All right, you gave up Kansas City for Vegas. You know, not normally, but uh, new job made it worth my while. Okay, there's probably at not least as, for now. At least for now, they probably don't have as many good steakhouses in Vegas as they do in Kansas City. True, and the barbecue is. Uh, I haven't been yet, so yeah. I, I'm sure it won't measure up. Yeah, uh -huh. Mark. Hey, Mike Treat, uh, Condition Orange Preparedness. Uh, originally, it was out of Minneapolis. Now we're in Nebraska. Um, do uh, defensive handgun, shotgun, do some revolver too, uh, one revolver class a year. They like to get everybody on just a defensive revolver skills class. Um, thing I'm probably known for is the civil unrest stuff. Uh, I got a book coming up about that uh, later in the summer. Uh, hear about that a little bit later. But uh, force and force, that's another thing that uh, I teach, uh, do role playing, teach role players. So that's a little bit about me. How are you enjoying your move to Nebraska from Minnesota? It's been awesome. The winters are shorter. <laughs> the, the, now we got some pollen here, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's in the, I love getting around this town. The streets make sense here. Not like in the Twin Cities. Nothing yeah. makes sense in that town. <laughs> it's, it's great being back on the plains, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to your city once. Yeah. I flew in and out of there. And that was the beginning and end of a of a trip, and uh, got to play tactical peekaboo with a homeless guy in the yeah. hotel parking lot at like three thirty in the morning, which was which interesting. And uh, thankfully, I saw his shadow from the street lights yeah. as he moved, and I was already watching for him because I I had seen in the daytime when I arrived at the hotel the, the day before, I had seen homeless people going down a trail. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I need to be watching from that area when I come out of the hotel in the morning to go to the airport. And um, as I was walking towards the exit door from the lobby, I saw I saw the shadow flash. And so I had time to plan. So it was not a uh, a uh, surprise attack. I actually surprised him because I, when I went out the door, I immediately hard left. And he was not expecting that. And he kind of froze. And then the people that were coming behind me hadn't seen him. And so then he, they got the chance to experience him. And uh, I went on and got in my car and drove off. But that's you the fun of being in any big city, no matter what big city it is. 
Well, you can definitely find a good steak place here. This is beef country, so yeah. And uh, I have discovered the Runza, R U N Z A, the the local. It's like a Nebraska thing. Okay. Um, yeah, if you're here, you definitely got to check out the Runza. That's okay. Yeah. We well, found a pretty good burger joint uh, mm -hmm. there, but I, I can't remember the name of it. All right. Well, I guess we'll get rolling. Steve, the first question is yours. Okay. Well, what? For those of you, well, let me ask a question first. How many of you lived or live in a state that requires some formal training before they will issue a concealed carry permit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, two, three. I also, I know Lee doesn't because he lives in the state <laughs> that I live. So with constitutional carry coming on, and the thing that triggered this was I heard some instructors complaining online or on, on the internet, uh, lately Florida instructors with the passage of uh, permitless carry there, the impact on their training business mm -hmm. and how they wish that people were required to get training, which I find interesting in the uh, world of Second Amendment rights, et cetera, that they would want to uh, complain about the fact that people don't need a permit to carry. So is, did you see an impact on your business and how did you deal with it? So, Warren, you're the first up to answer. Okay. Uh, yeah, Oklahoma requires an eight-hour class. We do have constitutional carry. We we have we at first saw, and I don't do a lot of licensed classes anymore. I'm mostly doing instructor development for instructors to teach those classes, so I don't have to. But we saw it go down just a little bit. If you research what Kansas went through, and there was another state, but right before that, the same thing happened here. That it dipped a little bit, and then people started. You know, going for reciprocity. So one of the things I, I always advertise is the reciprocity. And number two, something that people don't think about is the uh, school zone, the uh, Gun Free School Zone Act. That's a federal law that says you can't be within a thousand feet or two thousand feet of a school with a firearm. And then there's exceptions. Well, one of those exceptions is if you have a license to possess that firearm by the, your, the state that you're in. So really, every time you drive by a school with your handgun license, you're in violation of federal law. And so I always bring that up and say, and I always I, I tell my cops to go get their license too, for that same reason, because we're not exempt either off duty exactly. It's kind of hazy. So it it usually affects somebody a little bit at first, and then you end up seeing the same numbers kind of come back. In, in the in the two states I studied and in Oklahoma. Wow. Uh -huh. What, do you have any estimate on the percentage of population in Oklahoma that was coming for the training? I, I would not have a clue. I would not have okay. a clue on that. I probably should have done more research on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I started teaching uh, concealed carry in 2016, the same year that Missouri passed constitutional carry. Uh, I ended up doing that very little because the county sheriffs that I had to work with were difficult. Uh, to put it lightly, but um, all the ranges near me, everybody else who taught, very similar to Warren, a short, a brief dip as people uh, was like, oh, I don't have to have a permit right now. Uh, but then the reciprocity, some of the additional protections, all the ranges nearby, concealed carry is the number one thing that they would make their money off of. Almost every class was full up every weekend. And an example of how much that was there were about a dozen ranges within an hour, hour and a half of my house, all of them taught. And then that's not including, you know, your little mom and pop, hey, I'm renting out a room to teach you the lecture. And now we're going to go to the range also, uh, which, you know, dozens and dozens of carry instructors. I, I don't think it had much of an impact overall in the long term. And um, and I, a few people, it seemed like that actually caused an increase in business because they hadn't thought about it until it was permitless. And then it felt kind of hinky to them. They got, they got kind of the heebie-jeebies of carrying without a permit. Even though it was okay, it still felt weird not to have the plastic card, you know, blessing you to be able to do that. Especially on the Kansas City side, we're very close to Nebraska, Kansas, you're crossing state lines and, you know, people unsure of if that was okay. Well, Kansas is also constitutional carry, but am I covered there? I'm not sure. Let's go get a permit. Mike? Yeah, and I kind of dovetail on what Dan was talking about too. I, uh, 
still occasionally teach classes back in Minnesota for permit to carry. They call that up there. Um, yeah, and I was also working with private security contractors for lack of a better term, protective agents. So um, being ready to certify people from out of state, because there you can have an out of state uh, permit. Nebraska here, you do have to have a permit, but it's been inching closer to permitless carry or constitutional carry. Probably will happen this year, but we have one. We have one representative doing a seriously long, like three month long filibuster holding of everything else. So, but uh, I've heard some instructors locally, not too many of them here, that complain about like, well, it's not that it's the business; it's just that that's the only introduction to any safety training that you know somebody out there walking around legally with a gun will ever probably get. Um, I would even go a little further and say, yeah, the the legal side of it too. Um, you know, I spent yesterday watching a bunch of videos that were just popping up left and right of like, you know, I think there's like the one of a guy kicking somebody's pickup truck at a gas pump. And then the guy just pulls a gun on, puts two rounds in and puts them down. You know, it's like, well, uh, yeah, that's not legal. But just them having that that understanding of like, you know, the, the affirmative defense and all that. So that, that's what I spent a lot of time on, like, you know, was preparing for a constitutional or permitless carry to say, OK, well. Yeah, you, you can probably just legally walk around if you can own the firearm, but do you understand the legal aspect of this? Um, so um, the, uh, the what was the other thing here was, uh, yeah, and then the handling side of it, uh, you know, there, uh, we see plenty of people who come through the first class, you're like, wow, have you, have you gotten this far without shooting anybody? <laughs> um, reciprocity was the other thing too, was, you know, you might have, uh, you might travel to another state that has reciprocity as long as you have a state permit. I think there were a few for a little while that were doing that. If I remember correctly, I think it was like there was something going between Arizona and, and Idaho, both constitutional carry, but to carry in the other person's state, I believe that might, I might be wrong in this, but I know there were a few states where like you had to have a, a permit from your state, even though it was constitutional carry to, to get the reciprocity honored in another state. So, um, you know, I always just tell people, hey, it's it's worth it to have that card. So. Yeah, Warren referenced the, the Gun-Free School Zone Act on the federal level. I saw something online, uh, someone claiming that that section of the law had been overturned, but I'm not certain if it has, and I'm not willing to play, play that risk. Well, uh, the last I checked on it was earlier this year. Now, it has been overturned several times. For various reasons, but the last I checked, it was valid. The reason that uh, they forgot the interstate commerce part, which is how the feds get all their mm -hmm. get all their power. So yeah. they put the interstate commerce part in there. And the last I knew, it was it was still flying. Yeah, I'm just not willing to take that risk. There's there's no reason to. And uh, like I say, the last time I looked, I looked up again though. Uh, as Steve mentioned, Georgia has never had a training requirement to get what we call the weapons carrier license in its last iteration. Uh, before that, it was um, uh, Georgia firearms license, and before that, it was the pistol toters license. We've never had a document called a concealed carrier license here. Uh, but the license also required for open or concealed carry, and that was always something we battled in misinformation. There's people would think, you know, I need to get my concealed carry license, but people would tell them, well, open carry, it's legal. And it was not. Uh, both had to be covered. Uh, you had to have the carry license to cover both of those. Um, there were also some loopholes in, in the Jim Crow era of Georgia. There was an uprising of black folk in South Georgia who were tired of getting treated the way they were being treated. And in the wake of that, it's in our state legislative history. It's not something people are just making up. It's in the legislative record. Uh, we can't have black folks carrying guns. So they passed, uh, the state did pass a loophole to the, what was then called the pistol toters license that you cannot or may not carry at a public gathering. But they never defined what a public gathering was not in legislative efforts or not in judicial decision. And so what that did was it left it open for each local magistrate and, and superior court to decide what open, I was, you know, what a public gathering was. And so it could be selectively enforced all it wanted to be. Uh, 2008, that was finally repealed. Uh, 
I don't typically get the intro level student. People that, that train with me are typically looking for me or looking for what I offer. So I'm not getting the, and I don't have a tie in with like a local range to, to feed, to feed into. So, you know, I get generally get students that are looking for the specific stuff that I offer. But I know one day I got on the USCCA webpage and looked for instructors that were in my area. And there was a multitude of instructors that I had never heard of. Didn't know who these people were. Like it would have the address for where they were teaching the class and it would be a, a residence. <laughs> and everything's like, okay, so how are you doing a shooting class at your residence? And then it would have something else in their class advertisement. This class qualifies you to, to obtain the Georgia concealed carry license. Oh, <laughs> Well, there's no class for that. And two, how are you doing this? Yeah, I don't know how they're pulling it off, but it's they're still marketing to the people that just don't know. And probably those people aren't affected by the fact that Georgia doesn't require a training group because they're getting people that are coming to classes thinking they have to get it to uh, take the class to get their license. Uh, we would teach classes through the sheriff's office, and I had people afterward ask, "Well, hey, will this qualify me to get my?" My carrier, well, you just go up to the probate court. They'll give it to you whether or not you've had this class. <laughs> so, yeah. Warren, yeah you find uh, Cornell Law does still list it on their on their website. Okay. It's uh, all the gun stuff is 18922. And that uh, Gun Free School Zone Act is uh, mm -hmm. subsection Q, I believe. All right. Uh, I'm not certain how it affects states that had like specific off-limits areas unless you had a carry license or permit for like going into places that served alcohol and the like um you know now that they've gone permitless carry what i want to call it constitutional carry because if it's constitutional carry you carry wherever you wanted to um <laughs> you know how does that impact in your state say like if your state says you can't be on the premises of anywhere that serves alcohol for consumption on the premises unless you have a carrier license and like mississippi's got like two levels of carrier license uh i, I don't know how going constitutional carry so-called or permitless carry impacts that in the states any of y'all know no i i know missouri get, gave you some additional benefits for carry, but there were still a lot of restrictions anyway. Um, there were some interesting ones where you're banned in a school, even with a permit, unless you get the like written consent of the superintendent, um, which I don't think was related to you having a carry permit at all. It was just you got the thumbs up from the guy, mm -hmm. and then you could do basically whatever you wanted. Uh, Places that serve alcohol, you could it's like 51% of their revenue had to be from alcohol. And then anybody was banned from doing that, but you could go to Applebee's and have, you know, and you're just fine, even though they yeah. serve a beer. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't drink, so I don't pay attention to the, to that kind of stuff, but it, it's just, I know that at one point in time, there was a difference in some places as to whether or not it was a bar or a restaurant yeah. that so and they like there was to make these things if it sold if less so much of their revenue as certain percentage of, like you just mentioned there well, yeah. and i i would see people try you know well how do i know if it's that and nobody yeah. actually knew but everybody right. had a different explanation well if it's grill and bar grill is first so it's mostly food well if it's <laughs> bar and grill it's mostly alcohol because they said bar first well a pub is different you know than a bar and like well, where's this written oh i don't know where did yeah, you hear I love this how from? People make I don't that remember. Stuff Somebody up. told me. Yeah. You know. yeah, yeah. I think Texas has the fifty-one percent signs, and yeah. that's what we've been trying to push here. Is like this is not fair to tell somebody because there's a couple places that I wouldn't know either yeah. if it's more of a restaurant than a bar. There's some places that are pretty obvious, but that's the difference between being totally fine and being a felony, mm -hmm. and the state doesn't offer any guidance on it. So it's something we're trying to push for. And this the school stuff is it's really gray it's really gray it talks about being able to drive you know yeah. drive up and drop your kid off or to park your car and lock your gun in your car and then you can go in and that's fine but then it's 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 so it's so gray and then of course the uh you can carry if you work there if you're an employee if the school board signs off on it and you go get a reserved 
peace officer certification, not a full-time reserve, and, or a security guard license. So no teachers are going to do that. No janitors are going to do that. So we just basically don't have don't have an effective policy yet or effective laws yet on that. But uh, Georgia law says that if you have the weapons carrier license that you or you may have had the firearm on your presence while you're during picking up or dropping off of your child. And you'll see some people kind of like Dan was was pointing out, they'll they'll make up something. It's like, well, that means yeah. car rider line, or that means, well, my interpretation <laughs> says picking up or dropping off of my child. If you show up at 1 15 in the afternoon to get your child to go to a dentist appointment, and you have to walk into the office and sign them out. That's during picking up and dropping off of your child. Mm-hmm. Now, if you drop your child off and you go into the gym and start shooting hoops or you go walking down to go talk to one of their teachers, at that point, you're not picking up or dropping off anymore. Um you know, so you'll you'll see these things that get put in the legislative portion of law, but until there's a judicial decision on it at the appellate level, we really don't have a judicial interpretation of what the law means. Because what happens at trial court does not form precedent for anything. Right. Any any other stuff on that topic, Steve? Did you have any follow up on it? No. Nope. All right, Warren, it's up to you. Phobia is. Uh, anybody who knows me relatively well knows I'm a really obsessed with phobias and how to get help people get over them. So phobias and firearms, uh, two part. What do you think? Or how do you guys deal with that? Do you recognize it early enough that you can help that person with their phobia in a class? And do you think it's valid? I have a class I taught at Active Self Protection Conference last year on phobias and firearms, and it's for students and instructors. And it went pretty well. So what do you think the validity is of a class like that for instructors and students? Because it's not something you can just pick up on. And the reason that I the reason that I did this is because one of my very first classes I taught, I didn't pick up on it. And the, this poor lady, I had her on the stand on the right by her husband. Her husband shot around and the brass hit her and she thought she'd been shot. <laughs> and she just screamed out and she's never touched a gun since then. And that was eight years ago. And it still bothers me. So I'm trying to get, I'm trying to see, you know, how, how best, how's the best way to move forward with, it, with this and try to help people with it, help instructors and students. Hmm. All right, Dan, you're the first up. Yeah, I, I haven't had anybody have, have uh, quite a dramatic of response as that. There have been some people, there's definitely been tears on the line. Um, there was a uh, one shooter. I, I was teaching somebody younger, and they were too scared to pull the trigger. Uh, and we're shooting a single shot bolt action twenty two rifle. And uh, you know I can't do it. I can't do it. It's going to be loud, scary. And I'm like, all right, what if I pulled it for you? Well, okay. Oh, In, hmm. instant resolution. People, you know, people cry. The folks who have cried. It's always you know you're crying in public. It's embarrassing. You know, we're told mm-hmm. not to do that. It's like, hey, it's okay. You're not the first one. Really? Like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. A, a lot of people do that either because it's the stress, it's noise, it's recoil, you know, what have you. Have, well, have you ever cried on the range? Well, no. Well, like, I haven't, but I had a pretty good introduction to it. Yeah, But I, I haven't had the big fear and the, like, I'm never going to touch it again. Most of the people I've taught, if they were scared at first, at the very least, it was a, you know, Maybe not I enjoy this and I'm excited to do it again, but well, now it's not scary because I've done it. Uh, I, I think the biggest trouble I've had is moving people from like rim fire up to like a nine millimeter because uh, that's a pretty substantial gap. And up until more, you know, most 380s are significantly small enough where that gap in caliber is worse. And like, hey, this Ruger LCP is going to be horrible to shoot, shoot my Glock instead. Uh, and for me, like that—that th- that was the biggest issue I had. And I would just start people on the nine, like that way. That was the baseline, you know. It, this is what it feels like. It's not too bad. All right, we've done good. We'll go back to the twenty-two now, or maybe move up wherever. Uh, but yeah, I—I'm gonna message you after this about the phobia class. That sounds interesting to me. Yeah, please do. Yeah, Mike. This is kind of been the unique thing for me. Three years ago, uh, business boomed, as you can imagine, where I was at. And a lot of I wonder I, what could have caused that. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I was just baffled because uh, in 2019, I could barely get two people in a classroom. And then suddenly it's like, uh, <laughs> we got three a week. <laughs> After that, shrimping got easy. <laughs> yeah, I actually started certifying instructors just to help places keep up with volume. <laughs> um, you know, and that, and that, that was interesting for about a year and a half there. Uh, after May 2020, we had, well, uh, yeah, uh, early 2020, we had uh, had a lot of people who were not gun enthusiasts. They, if I would have seen them a year before, they would have wanted to ban every AR-15 and you name it. And some of those folks who've come through classes uh, now, you know, get a hold of me once in a while. I'm like, hey, I'm building my third one. I'm, I'm going to build two more. And it's like, good on you. Just remember. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> politics aside, uh, yeah, we had a lot of new people and, and um, never had touched a gun never been in a gun store never the the closest they ever saw a gun was on a cop's hip that was it um and then suddenly they're going to go out and buy one or uh they're now decide okay i'm going to carry this thing um and the the interesting thing was those folks had approached this more like an educational process so i had that going for me i had a i had a retired a pair of retired college professors sitting in front of a class one time it was adorable they were sitting there with their notebooks and you know, I'm like, great, I'm actually teaching two PhDs something here. Okay. And, but they were, you know, asking all the questions and everything. And um, the, you know, so anything you told them, they listened, they did it. Um, the phobia of it, uh, or the fear of it, you know, I'd ask them, you know, is there, you know, do you have any, or is anybody here scared of doing this? And it's okay. You know, and uh, plenty of hands went up. I'm like, that's awesome. Thank you for being honest. The big thing I've always had, uh, like, because our, you know, back in Minnesota, in any state where you have to qualify uh, doing live fire, we would uh, we'd take them out on the range as little as possible at the very end of the day. Um, but I would do a lot of front end work, doing dry work, doing handling, just getting the introductory motor stuff down so that, you know, when they got out there, 75 percent of it, you know, uh, might fall to the side, but that 25 percent that they retained. Uh, they could still perform the state qualification, the minimum, which you know, they needed to pass. And um, the the one thing I would do is I, I've had a couple of students, those indoor public ranges where we have to qualify them on a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday afternoon, you know, and every, everybody's just shooting left and right, couldn't get a private range. But factoring that in, the moment, and I tell them, okay, when you walk in here, the air pressure is going to change. There's going to be things, you're focused on doing this thing. So if you're nervous, you need to step out, it's totally fine. You know, and I have a few people who would do that and like, okay, come back 30 minutes later. And um, some just decided, hey, can we do this another day? I'm like, no problem. I can facilitate that. But uh, I never, you know, a lot of us just leaving the door open for them to walk away from it if they wanted to. And I had plenty of people who were enthusiastic about it, walking in the door, like I'm waiting to do this. And by the time I usually, by the time I get done with the legal portion of the class, they're like, well, I'm going to get the certificate, but carrying a gun is not for me. I'm going to get some pepper spray or something like that. Um, and then there were some people who were just terrified of shooting, but they like, I got to do this thing. And by the time I got done showing them, teaching them basic, you know, the fundamental stuff up front, oh, they were just, they just loved it. You know, and I probably, I was probably gun salesman there without even working in a gun store for a little while because of it. You know, they'd, I'd run into them when I was doing a private lesson. They'd come, Hey, look at this new thing I bought. I'm like, awesome. <laughs> so, and, uh, a couple of those people now want to be instructors. So. But uh, but that was a lot of us just, you know, easing them into it and doing a lot of non-live fire, a lot of dry fire stuff, a lot of handling, a lot of, you know, uh, doing, you know, their, their fundamentals, their mechanics. So it's so that they have a lot of uh, reps up front. If you take like a martial arts approach to it, you're doing a lot of shadow boxing or a lot of uh, a lot of conditioning until so you do a lot of that until when the real thing happens, um, you really put some live rounds down or. Uh, that that first time you're doing a sparring session, it's like okay, I've done combinations, basics, whatever it was. Um, you have some automatic automaticity, and um, that helps. But it the uh, but setting it up so because you're like at eight hours with them is trying to get them to do enough so that they if they do go off to practice, they're set up right to do practice. And that's certainly the case with like having taught in service when I was doing that for you know my former state. Um, like, yep, I get eight hours a year. Uh, I'm going to tell you to go practice these tactics. Nobody does, but a few who do, it's like, all right, the mat room's over here, you know, Tuesday we'll meet up and whatever. But anyway, 
went down a went down a trail there on that. But uh, uh, but yeah, it's just acknowledging and, and giving them a you know a, you know a, a door to go out of for you know taking a break from it and, and stepping up. But I, and I see that all the time when I'm in there, just you know at a public range, the date night, and you can just tell, yep, somebody is not comfortable mm -hmm. over there, and they need to walk out for a minute and take a break, you know, because I just, I hate indoor ranges. So <laughs> anyway. Well, you know, people come into a firearms class and learning that a firearm isn't for them and that they want to seek an alternate method for protection. That's just fine. Yeah. That, yeah. That's just fine because they may actually find a tool that they'll actually carry and have confidence in using if they have to. Mm -hmm. well, Steve. And I think to that end, Lee, it, so long as they had an ample opportunity to really find that out, right? And that's, that's part of what we have to do, I think, is give them the opportunity to discover it accurately. They could, they could make that determination prematurely uh, if we don't handle it right up front. I'd be interested in your class as well, Warren, so uh, I'd love to get some more information on that. One of the things that has worked well for me, and you talked about phobias, I assumed you meant phobias around guns and not fear of falling or anything like that. Um, well, we actually touch on that a little bit in the class. We actually draw some some parameters to that or some uh, similarities. The phobia of fear of failing in front of others, you know. So that that's something that comes up a lot of times um, with uh, newer shooters. One of the things that's worked well for me is I do a class called Everything But the Bang. And I've actually done this at clients' homes and they'll get two or three couples together and I'll show up with guns in pieces. I'll have them disassembled and i'll actually assemble we'll assemble the gun so that they can see what all the pieces are and you got to take a lot if you take a lot of the mystery out of it or the magic whatever term you want to use it helps them a lot uh and we'll do it in their own home we'll find a safe backstop we'll put up some paper targets we'll go through we'll use dummy rounds we'll go through all the manipulations and everything kind of what mike was talking about you put everybody through a lot of work up front so that that's familiar to them. And then at the end, uh, I'll put in a G side or a pink rhino type laser insert. I'm able to confirm that they have proper side alignment and everything by seeing that little red dot show up on the target when they pull the trigger. They they see that if they line up the sights, the dot's going to show up where it's supposed to be. They get used to the trigger pull and everything else. And then we put everything away and then they break out the wine and the beer and they relax a little bit. And then the next day we'll go to the range. Um, now I have done it also where it's, you know, we do that in the morning and then break for lunch and then we go and shoot in the afternoon. But if you, too many people have been to the range with their significant other or their friend or their buddies where the guy handed them a gun and said, here, have some fun. And that, you know, it's, it's like trying to ride a bike without training wheels the first time you got a bunch of scraped knees and bruised up elbows. So anyway, uh, without going too much, too many times around that barn, I think the more we explain it to them. And one of the dangers we have to be careful, uh, pitfalls we have to avoid is it becomes so familiar to us, we forget how strange and different it is, particularly to new shooters. You know, which way does the bullet go in the magazine? Uh, how does this slide lock back, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's kind of what I do to try to avoid that situation. But I'll, I'll finish with the story when uh, Tiff and Ock ran a uh, new shooters class down at Red Hill Range, and there was this one lady, and after her first shot, it was everything I could do to keep her from running to the car. But yep. she stayed and did the rest of the class, and she was just fine. Um, I've got one note that kind of ties into both Steve and Mike. Uh, and Steve, we talked about, right, forgetting that, you know, how long we've been doing it versus a newbie. Um, that's something that I've seen a lot. I on the I keep a uh, plaque from the first shooting match I ever shot hung in my room. Third place, first match, I was three of three in my division. I was like 197 of 200, and two of those guys DQ'd, uh, right? But there's a lot of shooters, I you know, a lot, a lot of new shooters, because most of the people I taught, you know, um, women, the LGBT community, people not from the gun industry, you know, not, not from the gun community. And uh, you're talking about there's a lot that goes into it, and just the reinforce, like, hey – it, this is a process, right? Look how good you are compared now after learning a little bit compared to all these other people on the public range where if we describe their targets as being shot with buckshot, that would be a disservice to the cheapest, you know, surplus buckshot. Um, but here's the tools that we've given you. 
and over time with you know practicing every now and then just shoot out you know a couple times you know you'll be able to grow up here don't expect to be able to pass whatever drill it is first go you know because not, none of us could do that either or at least i don't think any of us here could have done whatever it is we've done now however many years ago and usually they kind of like okay like i'm better than i was i've actually done the thing i've got a leg up and now i know how to move forward however much i want to grow or um as I said previously you know now i want to go do something else guns not for me i want oc i want whatever maybe i'll come back to the gun later when i'm more comfortable which is also you know right also okay you're always welcome to come back if you change your mind yeah, I don't work with the typical new shooter all that often. I did have one in a free class we did at the sheriff's office several years ago that was very phobic of the round going off and the, the, the noise. And so we got her plugs up under earmuffs and loaded her you know, pistol with one round and coached her and gently through that first round and she went from tears to smiling with tears to by the end of the day she was just smiling um i had another class where a woman wasn't new to firearms at all uh but she worked as an emt and had just recently had a gun pointed at her on the job and was having some issues getting over that and coming to the range was the first for my class was the first time she'd been out on the range since that incident and her husband told me what was going on and i just went and spoke to her and said look anytime you feel overwhelmed just set your gun down on the barrel in front of you go have a seat it's fine you do what you want to don't do what you don't want to etc and one point in time in the class she well, she did she set her gun down she went and sat down on a chair i walked by her you're okay she's like yeah and we kept on with the class and eventually she got up and came back in and she finished the class and did everything um but I think Steve touched on something about it being the mystery. And what I've started doing with our jailers that are getting ready to go to the academy is that instead of taking them to the range for their first exposure to the firearms, they come to my office, which is climate controlled. You know, I put away all the live ammo, all the all the, the stuff, and we sit in there with dummy rounds and they load and unload magazines. And then they load and unload the pistol. And then they take the pistol apart and they put it back together. And we do all that kind of stuff. And so now when we go to the range, there's less mystery about the gun and how it works. And we do some other stuff in that first session. And I tell them, it's okay to not remember all of this when you come to your first range session. We'll walk, we'll walk through it. We'll get you there slowly. And what I'm finding since I've taken that approach is I'm getting better success in that first range session than I did previously. Yep. All those things are fantastic guys. I just sent you the PDF of the PowerPoint and you should be able to glean most everything out of there into our group chat that we had, mm -hmm. but there's just too, there's too much to it to cover in, in the, you know, in one question, but I just kind of was curious how, if you guys had kind of the same approach that I have, uh, I actually stole the, the taking the gun apart from, Tatiana Whitlock. She does that with AR-15s and ladies only classes and has them actually take, they have the guns apart and then they just put them back together. I think and it, it, it was, some stole that brilliant. from her. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah, Steve I, I stole, stole that from, one from her Tatiana. too. <laughs> what, I'll, what I'll do sometimes is I'll take, I'll, I'll try to catch them coming in. I'll try to catch them with the body language coming in. And so I'll, you know, we don't use live guns in class, but I, they'll make it, slight exception in that i will if i spot that person i'll say hey what if i uh take this over and put it on my table here and then i'll take over and I'll, instead of using a dummy gun for grip and stuff i'll take their frame and give it to them and have them use their frame and then as the class goes on i'll take another piece of the gun like the barrel and put it over there in front of them and just kind of gauge their reaction and then pretty soon i've got the whole thing there now we don't put it fully together until we go out to the range but i'll let, let her let her or him usually her put it together and it really does seem to make a lot of difference so i was anyway, just want to kind of want to see what you guys were doing uh, Dan? yeah um so my question comes from a conversation i was having a couple of days ago specifically regarding uh instructor development so you know several of us we've gone through our different instructor schools we've watched videos we've taught ourselves 
Uh, one thing that I've heard a lot for years is the best thing you can do is AI for somebody, apprentice under somebody else, right? Makes sense. Um, but there's a few people I know who have tried, like, really, really tried to do that. They've reached out to other instructors in the local area. They've taken multiple classes with those guys, gotten some FaceTime, have built a relationship. And then it's the, Hi, hey, I'd like to, you know, be the guy to come hang your targets and set up target stands, sweep brass. If you want an extra set of eyes on the line to, you know, make sure people are being safe, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, I'll pay for a spot in class also. And then it's the, a few of these guys are the repeat. Nope, nope, we're good. Not looking for that right now. No, thank you. Like, well, I've exhausted all my resources locally, you know, to find somebody to do that under. I'm not a law enforcement or military guy where I can, you know, find a uh, training officer or uh, something along those lines. Like, what do I do now? I don't know, you know, I don't know Lee or Tom, and I so I can't go and do that with these guys. You know, I'm not going to call up somebody a couple hours away who I've never met before and they don't know me to try and drive out there. Like, what is your suggestion? And so now I bring that question to a diverse panel of people to see <laughs> uh, what your guys' ideas are. Well, Mike, you're up first. Well, this is, uh, I'm kind of in a unique position with that one. I happen to have a significant. Apparently, I can't talk today. <laughs> <laughs> I have a significant other. My wife, uh, Brenda, uh, will uh, will accompany me on classes as an AI and also runs as RSO. Um, and uh, why that is a, th is a big deal is because she has a master's in adult education, learning, and development. Uh, so as far as like how to run a class, I defer to her. <laughs> curriculum development any idea i get I, it might take me six months to figure something out and you know okay this time i'm going to do it i hand it to her it's done in 20 minutes I'm like so like here now go teach this like all right um what i have also done is i've taught other things though other disciplines so you know firearms are unique because we're on a facility or range you know sending uh lead pills down to the paper there or the steel um so there's a little bit more of a, a safety aspect to it too but I think a lot of it is, um, you know, the, the technical skills, we can learn that. It's how to teach people or help people learn, rather. Um, and so, like, if I'm running a, a classroom, uh, just, just a lecture portion or uh, presenting something, we're not on a range or anything like that, uh, there will be times when, you know, I'll forget to do something or I have her standing in the background and she'll be holding up the cue card or writing something on a dry erase board in the background, like, hey, speak up, hey, you know give them a break. Hey, you know, it's, it's like having a floor producer, you know, in a TV studio. Um, so she coaches me on that. That's an advantage I have, but I would say if you can't, if you can't go AI with a firearms instructor, um, go, you know, a, a CPR class, go teach a CPR class or work with somebody doing that, see how they present their material. Um, that's what I would do. If, uh, the other thing is uh, going back to our friend Tatiana Whitlock too. Is you know she she said yeah I keep two notebooks. I've started doing that a couple of years ago when she mentioned I was like oh yeah and I've gone back to my, all my class notes. I'm like oh yeah here's how they delivered this part versus somebody else delivered this part. Um, you know taking the same class over and over with you know two or three different instructors picking something up. But um, but that's an advantage I, I do have as as my spouse <laughs> who has who you know teaches instructors in the corporate world. And, trains and develops that. So I, I have a resource there, but uh, uh, the uh, the one thing I have done um, has been following somebody around with a video camera. And you find it really fast. Do I want to be an instructor, an itinerant traveling around, you know, the country instructor? Um, you're right on the hip of the instructor filming everything. Uh, you, you find it really quick, like, yeah, those short breaks, well, they don't get any. Uh, it's like to be on your feet for 18 hours straight when you're doing doing this stuff. So, but you're seeing things through their eyes, like following around like a, a videographer for like an episode of Cops or some reality show. Um, you pick up a lot that way too. Now that's, that again, that goes back to like what Dan said, there, there may not be instructors who want to do that, don't want any videoing done. Uh, but I, you know, if you're good, you know, with the camera, 
Um, it's like, well, this is not something you're going to put in the internet, but it's a good way to video your work to see how you're teaching. So, you know, here's, here's the quid pro quo. I get to see what you do and learn, uh, how to improve my own work. And you get to, you know, have somebody following around filming you exactly outside yourself, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I guess ultimately I would say, you know, also learn how to teach something else and present something else or learn how to present, uh, other things. I went through, um, oh, it's been over 20 years ago when I worked for the state of Minnesota, the uh, first thing I ever taught was like first aid CPR. And before you could even do that, it didn't matter what you taught. Uh, you had to go through an instructor, train the trainer course for like a day. And they would just give you some sheets of here, uh, talk about how to use a flashlight during a blackout. And, you know, you got two or three basic things to go up, uh, you know, and, and teach. And what they were looking for was not what you were presenting, how you presented it. That was the whole point of that class. So, um, that's one thing I would, I would, uh, suggest anybody do. The other one is, uh, you know, uh, taking, finding some sort of training or, uh, a class on, you know, how to manage your classroom. Um, you know, just the, the etiquette and all that. I think Lee could probably talk about that because you, you teach other things outside of firearms, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually had to answer an email from a student. It was just a minute ago, if y'all saw me on the city video. Uh, <laughs> I had a student that emailed me this week because I had sent out instructions on, they have a citation log due today over a court case. And I had told them that their course names, excuse me, case names was almost always being italics. And I got an email from a student that said that their computer did not have italics. <laughs> so, oh, well, we're doomed. Uh, there, there are different things in the classroom and, and I'll come back to, to the other question so we can stay in order, Steve. Um, so Dan, let me make sure I understand is your question, yeah. how do they find AI experience if they haven't been able to find any, or how do they, uh, re substitute for AI experience? Um, so it could be that how, how to build experience as an AI, how to, um, you know, build themselves up as an instructor, uh, you know, anything that you think could be valuable there is somebody who's trying to learn and grow and they're finding themselves stifled, we'll say. Okay. Well, yeah. a couple of things they could do, uh, depending on where they're located, uh, they might find a local uh, IDPA or USPSA match and get certified as a SO and start running shooters. They'll, uh, they're going to be running one shooter at a time, but they're going to be running lots of them. You know, uh, running the defensive pistol matches, I've learned how to manage a crowd to an extent. Um, I have, you know, learned to watch a shooter, and I've had experience watching them, seeing things that they're doing wrong, occasionally point them out to them. Uh, so that that's helped me a lot. Of course, I've been fortunate enough to, be Lee's uh, director of engineering, get back coach and assistant instructor now for a few years. Uh, you know, if the guy, if, but, but if they can't find an AI position, then they need to ask themselves, is it me or is it them? <laughs> you know, I mean, there, I guess I can think of three situations. One, the instructor already has enough AIs and he doesn't want to kick one of them out to make room for a new one. Uh, the instructor may have an issue with the AI uh, the potential AI, or the instructor may have his own set of issues and that he's insecure and, and worried about stuff. Um, they could just start running their own classes. I can remember uh, it, it's good to have AI experience, um, but you know if you can't get it, there's a lot of people out there. If they've got a good certification, so let's take someone that's got a range master certification. You know, they've got a solid foundation in... Um, how to shoot, and they've got experience in running other shooters, coaching another shooter, et cetera. They could start running introductory classes. Um, so those are a couple of things that I would do. Is I, I wouldn't hesitate to start doing classes, understanding what lane I'm in and who I'm teaching. I'm not going to be doing vehicle classes, <laughs> et cetera. Um, but, and then you know, doing IDPA, they could even set up a, a local match at a local gun range. You know, a lot of gun ranges, they're very leery of someone that 
and very unreceptive to someone that wants to come in and conduct classes at that gun range because that's what that gun range does. Uh, at my local gun range, I do the re revolver and the shotgun classes because nobody else does them. They use USCCA for all their pistol classes. So I don't teach any of those and I don't ask to, et cetera. But I also run the, the defensive pistol match there. And that gets me a lot of experience and it gets, uh, it gets me some students. Um, they could maybe set up a local match at a local range if they've got uh, access to one. So anyway, that's my thoughts on it. Yeah. Warren? I would say, well, number one, don't be afraid to ask ever because <laughs> a, a no won't kill you. Um, other than that, it's just taking classes. And when I go to a class now, in fact, when I went to Range Master for my first one, I had to approach that as a student and a potential instructor and a writer. And that was a little intimidating because Tom has done all those things. <laughs> so anything I did wrong was going to be was going to be uh, more scrutinized. But every class I go to now, I'm looking at the instructor and I'm just taking it. So just I'm just taking what I can take from them and, you know, make sure I put up my slideshow credit to whoever that I stole it from. But uh, I think just taking classes as many as you can, and even from instructors you might not think are all that great, you're going to pick something up. Mm -hmm. uh, we should all be an amalgamation of, of all of our instructors, even the bad ones, because that's something we don't want to do. And it's a lot easier to uh, gain experience that way than the hard way of having something bad go wrong, like a lady getting hit with brass and never touching it again. So I would say take as many classes as you can before you even start to teach and slowly build your curriculum based on that, assuming you're not teaching the, something that's already built for you. Mm -hmm. I really think it's, I think that's as complicated as it gets. Just take as many classes as you can. And if somebody won't let you help them, take their class. It is a catch 22 because you do have, you know, that's one of the common pieces of advice that is given, go serve as an AI for somebody. Well, you have to have someone that's willing to let you be their AI uh, for that to happen. Uh, I will say from the lead instructor business owner point of view, um, those people are going to be very cautious as to who they let represent their brand. And so be, be, be cognizant of that if you're trying to ask, can you be an AI for someone? Um, that's a conversation that probably needs to be held in private and not on the range in front of other students, uh, that, that type of thing. So be very cognizant of that. Um, and for another thing, there has to be a relationship there that has kind of developed for, for that trust. You. Steve and I knew each other pretty well before Steve started helping with the classes and we had a good friendly relationship when we knew each other and could, knew we could communicate with each other and we have running jokes like Steve will send me a message the night before class like what do I need to bring for tomorrow and I said I don't know I haven't gotten there see what I've forgotten yet and you know, I, was like, I, I bought two sets of toolkits here recently and I'm going to give one to Steve because if Steve has one it may actually show up at classes because uh, if mine, it'll be left in my office or something somewhere. Just so as soon as I get that to Steve, uh, that's going to, you know, going to happen. I was fortunate enough that Tom Givens took me under his wing and then later Spalding. And then, and, you know, I want to pay that back to other people that are coming up. But, you know, you also got to be real ca cautious as to who you have standing beside you at a class and representing the brand. And I get real leery uh, about that. Um, uh, I know, see, I knew Steve before, you know, our relationship, you know, the AI thing came about and Steve actually goes and teaches his own thing and does his own stuff. And <sighs> keep plodding away, keep getting experience. If you can't find someone to serve as an AI for, just keep going, try to get into as many classroom management classes as you can get into outside of range stuff um getting into things like toastmaster uh, i know uh, tim reedy 
has talked along about that, about how it helps him. Um, just anything that you can do that keeps keeps developing you as an instructor. Uh, even though I've got a list of instructor certifications a page long, I still go to instructor classes each year, and I still go to student classes, you know, where I go as a student just to learn skills, not necessarily learning or picking up another certification. Uh, just everything you do, just keep building, 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 and building. And hopefully it's going to come. But I don't know if there's a definitive piece of advice to give to someone who's asking to be an AI and is not getting a positive answer. Yeah. I, other than what Steve said, that's probably the best. Yeah. I, I heard catch 22 and then my internet cut out. I'm sure that was an extremely well thought out answer that I'll watch in the, uh, in the playback. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything, you know, mat matches taking other people's classes. I, I, I use, uh, the hard back right in the rain notebooks. So they fit in the back pocket of my jeans and it's, like a nice firm thing to hold on to. I've got like five of them on my bookshelf back there. Yeah. I will say that when I first started helping Tom with stuff, he gave me a list of classes to go take and a list of books to read. Mm -hmm. And when I got through with that entire list, I'm like, all right, Tom, I'm done with the list. What do I need to do next? He's like, start teaching. But I don't want to. I want to keep <laughs> keep going to classes and stuff. And ultimately, I started teaching as a way to pay to go do other classes that I wanted to take. And that's kind of grown. And it's I've never used the teaching business or the firearms teaching business as a revenue source for like profit. It's uh, it's all a it all feeds back into me growing and developing. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as a student myself and getting better as an instructor uh, at some point maybe i'll start pulling money out of it to pay bills uh, i don't know uh that would probably right be a good off. thing yeah right now it's it's just money in money out going back uh, <laughs> to, to fund things so um mike i guess you're up uh let's do something different here um okay story time let's see first live round any of you guys ever fired? What was it? What did you shoot it from? And when or what was the context of the experience? Uh, whoever's first, I'm happy to tell you my story last because there's kind of a cool uh, uh, epilogue to it. But anyway, uh, yeah, so. Dan Daniel changed the when he had to log out and log back in, it changed everything <laughs> in my position. So it should be Steve <laughs> first. This will be cool. <laughs> okay. So I was down in Miami. This would have been 1972, 73. And I had a guy that I worked with. His name was Don Winchester. And he had no relationship to the Winchester Firearm <laughs> Company. And he had a roommate. His name was Steve Arms. And if you remember back in the 70s, well, Mike, you won't remember. Dan, you won't remember. But <laughs> they had these little silver. If you rented an apartment, you had this little silver square thing that was a combination peep site doorbell and a little thing to hold a dymo label with your name so in their apartment it said winchester arms that's what they had on their door <laughs> so they took me out shooting uh in a uh one of those uh dugout pits that they did when they were doing the all the canals in miami similar to the gentleman that was shot by uh, uh the miami bank robbers so we're out there towards the everglades and it was a Colt Python with a six inch barrel, 357. That was the first shot I ever fired. And I, I have that Colt Python today because Don Winchester sold it to me after we had both moved up to the Atlanta area. Uh, so that was my first shot. We, we shot a bunch of stuff. We went back and then I got my first smell of hops number, number nine cleaning fluid, cleaning all those guns after we'd fired all those rounds. And that was it. Four. I was four, and I was becoming a worry to my parents because I was so infatuated with the guns, and I, they caught me trying to go get one of them. So my dad had this really fancy RG something. I don't even know what model it is. In a twenty-two, he bought it for twenty-two dollars in nineteen seventy. 
and uh, my dad had to take me out to let to get the curiosity out let me shoot and he had me shoot a uh he put some red food coloring in a bottle to stimulate blood so it maybe scare me a little bit because <laughs> i was so nuts about it i've changed since then obviously i'm a little bit worse now but so uh, that was it and that was uh that was my first one i remember it like it was yesterday that's why when you asked the question i was like oh man like what is that and then i remembered that's cool Damn. Uh, this was probably 2000. Um, my mom's sister and I were living in a guest house on my aunt and uncle's property in rural Missouri uh, day after Halloween. And we set up all the jack-o'-lanterns on a uh, little mound uh, in front of the woods. And I'm pretty sure I was shooting a Marlin Model 60 because I remember loading through the tube and it being semi-automatic. And at one point being afraid, I'd put a round in backwards and then it would explode because uh, I don't know anything about guns. I'm like six and uh, shooting at that. A lot of fun. Don't know if I hit anything because it was just, you know, all right, lay down, shoot the rifle, you know, have fun. And then uh, when we were done with that, I fired one round of 12 gauge from some pump action shotgun. I don't know what it was as my uncle like tried to hold it on me from behind because I'm six and uh, it was loud and hurt my shoulder and made me cry. And I went back into our house and cried until my shoulder stopped hurting, but it didn't deter me uh, for long. I got BB guns, airsoft guns. Uh, and you know, now I'm here. Uh, so the 22 <laughs> rifle part, really cool. The 12 gauge shotgun part, horrible, but ironically I love shotguns now. All right. Prior to 1968, here comes the history lesson, everyone. <laughs> Prior to 1968, um, you could actually order firearms from like the Sears and Roebuck catalog, J.C. Penny catalog, etc. And there were companies that would make firearms, but they would put the stores label on them. Mm -hmm. Some of the big companies, some of the others. Uh, like Winchester used to make a version of the Model 94, but they would put Sears Ted Williams on it. But it was actually made by Winchester. Um, the Sears Ted Williams shotgun was a high standard flight king. And the first firearm I ever fired was a high standard flight king labeled as a Sears Ted Williams in 20 gauge standing in the pasture behind our house and that was the only benefit that i think ever that became of being the almost the youngest of all the grandchildren is that one of the other ones was being taught and i just happened to tag along all right you can step up here and shoot and uh, i got to fire my first round that way um and that shotgun is still available to me i don't have it but it is still available to me my question your story. Uh, so this might get a couple chuckles here. Uh, so in the mid nineties, I was in back in Minnesota. I was still there. Uh, let's see, I was 22 at the time. Uh, I was going, I was finishing up my law enforcement degree because in that state you have to have a college degree and get a post license from, and you go through a post. It's like a generic police academy. Uh, and the about six months long and i was just in the first phase of that uh so we weren't doing any firearms training until probably I don't know, almost five months later they put that at the very end but i had picked up a uh a, a night security job at one of the very few at the time armed security companies and uh i showed up at the office and they gave me the gear said okay you got to go get a uh you got to go take an eight-hour permit class at one of the few ranges that were around uh, the Minneapolis area at the time. And uh, they gave me the whole uh, uh, the, the uh, Bianchi, Sam Brown combo gear, whatever they, they had. And they gave me a Smith & Wesson Model 66, 357. And they gave me a box of 50 rounds, said, okay, you're going to go down, you're going to do this class for eight hours and uh, qualify with the, with these rounds. I think they actually gave me two box, one to practice and one to qualify with. Uh, I, I came back with a extra box but what happened was uh i got down there uh it was time to qualify at the end of the day last hour of the class and uh me being a dumb 22 year old macho guy doesn't want to admit yeah i've never shot a gun i'll handle this no problem well i didn't know what i was shooting 
And uh, they gave me 158 grain jacket and hollow point hydro shocks. <laughs> and and uh, I didn't know. In Magnum or about, special? Huh? In Magnum or special? Uh, Magnum, 357 Magnum. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know what? I actually did just fine. A uh, little stuff going left in the, you know, as a retired police chief who was teaching this, he's like, oh, okay, here, we'll correct this and that. The only thing I had going for me with that hand cannon was that I'm just big, you know. Uh, and uh, there was, as Daryl Bogan just called me at the at TACCON a few weeks ago, I was like, yeah, you know, Mike is a large, experienced mammal. <laughs> there, there's my Daryl impression. Okay. <laughs> Don't kill me, dangerous Santa. Anyway. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, so I, I shot that and, and uh I did I, I actually did pretty well. And uh I get back to the office and and uh the company uh and boss is like, Yeah, okay, how'd it go? I'm like, pretty good. Here's here's the rounds back. It's like uh I had an extra box of 50 rounds. He said, Okay, you uh oh well, you didn't practice, like no, they just ran qualification. And uh he's like, Oh, okay. And he's like, Did you bring your target? I showed him. He's like, Yeah, that's that's actually pretty good. He's like, You do a lot of shooting. I'm like, No, actually, I never shot a gun until today. And he's like, okay. And uh, I hand him back this box of 50 rounds. And he said, okay, that's actually your carry ammo right there. I'm like, what's that? I didn't understand, you know. <laughs> well, they had what it was, they had bought a bunch of surplus ammo from a the department that had went to semi autos that sold all the revolvers and their ammo. And so that's how we got a hold of that. And uh, yeah, they were supposed to send me down there with uh, 38 ball ammo <laughs> to qualify. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, I carried, you know, I worked that job while I was finishing college. And uh, when I came time to leave that job, I actually got a job with the police department uh, two or three years later. I had to hand that gun in. They offered, you know, to sell it to me for, I think it was like 250 bucks, whatever it was. At the time, I was so broke, I couldn't even afford that. And I had to let it go. But I really loved that gun. First one I ever shot, uh, loved the Model 66. It was a 66.3. And, uh, so anyway, that was probably 1998. Yeah, me and that gun parted ways. Come around 2000, I I run into uh, my supervisor back at the company. From that that company's no longer around, but anyway, he's a police sergeant in the suburb of uh, Minneapolis, uh, one of the little departments up there. And uh, so we met up and we're hanging out and got to talk about the old days and got to talk about those uh, revolvers and he brought out a, a couple of guns and he says yeah I, I when I bought the company I kept a few things and and I looked at this this gun and the side plate had some scratches I'm like well this looks familiar he's like yeah he's like that was your gun I'm like no kidding I was like well um cool um uh, sometime I, can I go shoot it sometime if you don't mind and he's like well we work out a little deal so I got my gun back 23 years later so <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that. I have few prized possessions, material things, but that's one of them right there. So, yeah. Anyway, me and that me and that gun are reunited, and it was, it was pretty cool. Is that that gun's birthday? Its 40th birthday was just last month. Uh, yeah, March 1983, and you know, it's inside the grips, and I ran the serial number and all that. So, um, yeah. But yeah, that was that was uh, probably the, the dumbest way you could probably learn how to shoot was you know doing a qualification with those hot loads like that. So. <laughs> With my first agency, we were issued Smith 4006s. And so I was given one to go through the academy. And probably a year or so after the academy, if that, um, one of the armors said my gun needed to be rebuilt. So he re went through and rebuilt everything, all the springs, everything else. So it's, it's as new as it could be. I don't know how many rounds were fired through it before I got it or how many other officers had it before I got it. Um, but the agency bought new Smith 4006s, and I was able to buy that gun, uh, the one that I'd gone through the academy with. So then we're issued the new 4006s, and I've got that one later. I oversaw our transition from Smith 4006s to Glock 22s, and we were all given the opportunity to buy the, the Smiths, and so I was able to buy that gun. I'm the only one that ever carried it. Um, I get the Glock 22 and you have to imagine this scene as we're all in a line in the hallway at the PD to get issued our new pistols. Well, we had noticed that, um, there was a pistol with the serial number had like the three letters and then six, six, six. 
was the serial <laughs> number. And myself and another sergeant were jockeying, trying to get, you know, we we're like counting the number of people back because he was handing them out in serial number order. And so we were counting, trying to be the one that got 666. And so finally we flipped a coin and, and he won. And so he got 666 and I got 667. Um, 667 became sentimentally valued. It was the first gun I ever fired 100 on the state qual course with. I took it out of the box, put lube on it, loaded it, shot 100 with it. All right, this is, this is a great gun. Uh, the sergeant that got 666 ended up, his house got burglarized and 666 <laughs> got stolen. <laughs> And so we would have great fun sitting around the PD talking about which actors were going to play us in the movie, uh, about him getting shot by his own gun with the serial number 666, <laughs> how it was all going to happen, all this kind of stuff. We were, we were going to relive the coin flip scene and everything in it. Ultimately, 666 was recovered, uh, but he wouldn't take it back. He, he kept the gun that, uh, that he had. Uh, when I left, I had to turn in 667. Um, Years later, they did an upgrade from that was a Gen 3. They swapped to Gen 4s. And the officer at the time that had 667 uh, did not want it. And thankfully, I had left on very good terms. I left being a sergeant to go be the chief at the next agency. And yeah, that's not one of the things they get mad at you about. And um, they took care of me. And I was able to buy 667. So I was reunited mm -hmm. with it. So I have every one of my issued pistols up until that point. It's funny how we get attached to things and those things stick in our head. <laughs> All right, we'll go around closing thoughts, Steve. A real quick question. Uh huh. Without a story, what's the one good you sold that you wish that you had back? Ooh. And I'll I'll give mine that make it very. It was a Colt Woodsman twenty two semi auto pistol. This was 78 or 79. I sold it and I've been kicking myself in the buttocks ever since. Warren? I don't sell anything nice. I don't sell a lot of guns at all. <laughs> but I did sell my very first Beretta 92 that I went to the academy with and shot 100 in the academy back before the new officer left behind course. And I do hate that I don't have that anymore. Dan? Yeah. There's a bunch, but probably my first 92. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mike? Yeah, I never really get attached to much. I mean, you, you heard what I, you know, I got reunited with mine, but uh, I will probably pick up another uh, Ruger New Blackhawk in 357 and 9 millimeter. That, you know, just, eh. Okay, that with a uh, an old single six, 22 and 22 Magnum, you know. Uh, what do you get? You know, multiple calibers, one gun. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm probably that's that's a hobby. I'm going to try not to take up the single action stuff, but you know, <laughs> good luck with that. But yeah, I uh, I think I would like to get those again. Uh, I think this time around, though, I'd probably get the uh, stainless steel. Uh, but yeah, that that's that's probably one gun I do miss. But it wasn't like an essential, you know, uh, thing. I you know, not really a collector, so again, I they're they're tools. They're Kind of like my my DeWalt drill or Cirque saw, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't, other than that, yeah, I really never sold anything that I, I felt bad about letting go. So. I I don't have one that haunts me, like one that I wish I would really could really get back. I did pick up a three thirty six in thirty thirty with that was pre cross bolt safety. At one point in time, that uh, I had to sell to pay a bill. I bought it, came home, found out I had the bill, immediately took it. <laughs> and so I never got a chance. I never even shot it, never did anything. And so I didn't learn, didn't, didn't get attached to it or anything like that. I have no sentimental value on it. If, of all the ones I've sold, I could have back that would probably be number one. But there's no, usually if I let it go, I'll let it go for a reason. And it just, uh, there's just nothing I really want back. Got rid of plenty of stuff I didn't want to keep. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I, for final thought. I'm, no, I'm sorry. Greg. I occasionally get on like a collection kick and like pick up things. Like I bought a bunch of Mosin Nagants one time, and at one point in time <laughs> I got into uh, Smith and Wesson end frames and picked up you know several of those along the way. But then I occasionally just go through and say, all right, it's time to anything that I'm not actively shooting. 
or that I don't have a sentimental attachment to, it's got to go. And I yeah. purge things out. And it's probably getting close to time for another purge. Yeah, but, uh, I, I think the dumbest one I did, I got a brand new 1301 from a, a gun shop closed down for like $600. And at the time, I thought shotguns were stupid. Like, why, why would I want this? I have an AR-15. Shotguns yeah. are for idiots. Um, and I sold it for like $700 to make a little profit, but give somebody a deal. And now I'm sitting there like, oh, no, <laughs> they're so expensive now. <laughs> what have I done? And, and it's not even like a cool classic gun. I've lost plenty of those too, but. Right. Yeah, the local range here just got a couple of uh, 1301 Gen 2s in, and they're like $1,679. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's nice. crazy. All right, Steve, final thoughts and what you got upcoming and where can people get in touch with you? Um, practical training for the armed citizen. There's a Facebook page if you want to go look for it. I don't really uh, publish it much. Uh, next time you'll see me is in a couple of weeks at the Cognitive Conclave. So those listeners that are attending hmm. uh, Lee and uh, Eric and John Hearn's presentation there, I'll look forward to seeing you there. And that's it. Right. There are four spots available in the Cognitive Conclave. You should jump on it. It's going to be a lot jump. of fun. And there's well, somebody I'll... nibbling at one of those. So uh, one of our distinguished Esquires has got a trial maybe the next week. And if he's if the trial ends up not going, he's going to buy a slot. Better call Mo. You better call Mo. Uh -huh. <laughs> Warren? I'm going to be teaching at the Active Self-Protection Conference in uh, September up in Kansas. If you guys get a chance to, to go to that, it's a really good, it's a good event. It's all for, uh, it benefits young people who are aging out of the foster system and a hundred percent of the money goes to them. Everybody donates their time and, and, uh, buy stuff and we auction stuff. And so it's a real good time. Uh, other than that, I'm mostly just teaching locally coming up the rest of the year and, uh, nibbling around at some other stuff. We'll see if anything else comes uh washes out but for now that's all for me i'm just uh doing a podcast here and there yeah well, if anybody has any good information on phobic students or want some information that i have reach out to me and where do they do that they would do that at defensive training services.com which is right there. or on facebook or on the defensive training services facebook page or Right. at customer service at defensive training services.com yeah. Uh, yeah final thought don't sell the gun unless you need the money uh, you'll re <laughs> regret it later uh, yeah you can I, I most of my writings on primerpeak.com you can find me on Facebook um, and maybe you'll see me at Tom's shotgun instructor class at Mead Hall this summer and maybe at gun site in May as a teacher, as a student, not a teacher. As a right. student, not a teacher. What class at gun site? Uh, looking at doing shotgun 260. Okay. Uh, I did that several years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, plan to use the shotgun as a carbine a good bit. Yeah. So uh, consider that when you select uh, amongst your shotguns, which one has a sighting system that is conducive to that. I was looking at uh, the 70 caliber carbine and shooting like 425 slugs in a couple of days is really interesting to me, but also not super thrilling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you won't shoot so many slugs that it, that it starts to, to wear on you. Yeah. Um, but pick, if you have an option of shotguns that have different sighting systems, the one that is most conducive to using it as a carbine uh, yeah. would, would be your best bet. I did not choose yeah. Wiley's in that regard, and I was, I was stubborn <laughs> and didn't switch. Uh, um, Mike? Uh, not much for final thoughts today other than uh, focus on what you're, you know, maybe not so great at, uh, deficits, right? Um, as far as uh, getting a hold of me, uh, condition orange preparedness, like the Cooper color code. Uh, right now for classes, uh, setting up in a new state, but uh, working at getting some partnering with Steiner Martial Arts Academy here in Omaha to do some force and force classes. Um, and uh, a lot of scenario based force and force. Um, and then uh, currently I've been uh, kept busy with a new day job. <laughs> That's eating up my time here for probably about the next six months. Uh, I'm also, uh, the big thing I've got going on, I'm finishing uh, 
the uh, my first book uh, should be out. Look at it, probably June. That'll be coming out, um, and that's about uh, experience uh, we had during the uh, 2020 Minneapolis riots. A um, bit of memoir, a bit of uh, lessons learned, uh, that sort of thing. And the book was getting so long that I had to cut it in half. And uh, so there'll probably be a follow up to it in about six months after the first one comes out, uh, talking about uh, the the, uh, the current the current state of uh, the criminal justice system in uh, certain jurisdictions. I'll just put it that way. It'll, it'll, it'll be fun. And uh, there'll probably be a few former guests on your show here, Lee, including yourself. We were probably getting, uh, I might be hitting up for a few uh, forwards on that one. So on uh -huh. the second book, but anyway, that's what I got going on. You know, you mentioned something earlier about how they meant to send you with 38 ball, and, but you ended up qualifying with, with the actual Hydroshock. You know, last week was the anniversary of Newhall. And that was one of the things that came up in that is that all the guys had ever shot in training was ball ammo, mm -hmm. but they reissue Magnum ammo and they get out in this gunfight and, you know, all of a sudden they have this huge, you know, plumes of flame and everything else. And it's frightening. It's disorienting to the point when all you've been used to is pop, pop, pop. And then all of a sudden your gun goes, boom. First inclination would be to think that something's wrong with the gun. Mm -hmm. and that something's gone tr dramatically wrong and so with that uh, make sure that if you're practicing with anemic practice ammo that you do take some time and run that i know the carry ammo costs more uh, but go run some of that through your gun from time to time and make sure that uh, you are accustomed to how that's going to perform in your gun the difference in the handling characteristics that are going to be there uh, you know, flash, et cetera, should be less flash with a good quality uh, defensive ammo or duty ammo. Uh, but if you're running shotguns and all you're ever doing is shooting birdshot and training, you need to run some buckshot through it every now and then and know what buckshot feels like. Uh, so that, I guess, would have been my final thoughts. You can find me, you know, on firstpersonsafety.com or that WilliamsGuy.com. You're the one who'll get you there. Uh, Lee at firstpersonsafety.com is the email address, stuff that I got upcoming. Uh, the Codron Conclave, which is the last weekend in April at Red Hill Range in Martin, Georgia. That is myself, Eric Gilhouse, and John Hearn. And we have a lot of fun stuff planned for that. Steve has been working his maniacal workshop, uh, coming up with lots of gadgets and gizmos and apparati uh, to, uh, to facilitate the lesson plan. So that'd be worth coming just for that, uh, plus the instruction. Um, my trigger management class in May is sold out. In June, I'll be teaching in Texas on a contract. And then late September, I've got a trigger management class up near Chattanooga, Dalton, Georgia area um, at the Cohutta Pines Resort and Ranch there. Um, that's all I've got scheduled for right now. But you can jump in that class for certain. And with that, everyone, I thank the audience uh, for coming together on short notice. Excuse me, thank the panel for coming together on short notice and being a panel today and the audience. We know that your most important asset is your time. Thank you for choosing to spend it with us. <laughs>